ಇಲ್ಲಿ ಇಲ್ಲಿ ಬರ್ತಾ ಇಲ್ಲ ಅದಕ್ಕೆ ಹಾಯ್ ಎವ್ರಿಬಡಿ ಕೆನ್ ಯುಯರ್ ಮೀ ಸರ್ ವಿ ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಹಿಯರ್ ಯು ವೆಲ್ ಸರ್ ಗುಡ್ ಈವನಿಂಗ್ ಗುಡ್ ಈವನಿಂಗ್ ಪ್ರೆಸಿಡೆಂಟ್ ಸರ್ ನಮಸ್ತೆ ಗುಡ್ ಈವನಿಂಗ್ ಗುಡ್ ಈವನಿಂಗ್ ಸರ್ ಟ್ರೆಸರರ್ ಕ್ಯಾಶ್ ಮ್ಯಾನ್ ವೈರಲ್ ಸರ್ ಕೆಂಚಪ್ಪ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಕೆಂಚಪ್ಪ ಕೆಂಚಪ್ಪ ಸರ್ ವಿಲ್ ಬಿ ಜಾಯ್ನಿಂಗ್ ಅದು ರೂಟೀನ್ ಹಾಗೆ ಇದೆ ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ಬೈ ಯು ಫಾಲೋ ಬೈ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಪ್ರೊಫೆಸರ್ ಸತೀಶ್ ಕೆ ವಿಲ್ ಬಿ ಗಿವಿಂಗ್ ಎಸ್ ಕಿನಾಟ್ ದೆನ್ ಫಾಲೋಡ್ ಬೈ ಯೂಸಿಂಗ್ ಗ್ರೇಡ್ ಇನ್ ಎವಿಡೆನ್ಸ್ ಬೇಸ್ಡ್ ಮೆಡಿಸಿನ್ ಬೈ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಗಾರ್ಡನ್ ಗಯಾಟ್ and next uh, cardiovascular and epidemiology guidelines by professor uh, rajiv gupta sir followed by real world evidence in practice by davinder chadha sir followed by panel discussion question and answers and uh, thank you note by me i am the master of ceremony so we will be sticking to time so talks i think we can allow more than 10 plus 2 3 4 5 is okay because we have only three speakers panel discussion also scheduled 15 minutes you can go ahead with the discussions game problem agita no problem uh, good evening uh, jordan sir gayat sir we are from csi bangalore actually we have more than 2400 cardiologist across karnataka out of which nearly 1000 are in uh, bangalore alone so we are a very big professional body uh, doing regular academics every month we are very happy to have uh, dr rajiv gupta sir thank <laughs> you sir aapka aashirwad chahiye csi bangalore ko davinder chadha sir to hamara he is a guide and mentor in all the difficult procedures i was oct left main branch lesions so very nice to have all three of you okay can you hear me can we begin i can hear happy to begin hello natraj shall i start sir with your permission shall i start yeah please go ahead yeah, yeah can you can you hear me ah yes sir i can hear you acha audible we will go ahead yes sir okay uh, very good evening uh, a warm welcome from cardiological society of india bangalore chapter uh, today we are conducting our uh, monthly meet this is a very special and a very a uh, high level uh, educational meet and i am thankful to, uh, for our sponsor uh, newman health for uh, arranging the session and uh, today's uh, topic is evidence guidelines and practice we are very fortunate to have our uh, international speaker dr uh, gordon gaid sir uh, we are uh, also very happy to have our national speakers who are the best in the field of cardiology and without why uh, wasting much time Uh, our president dr mahantesh charanthimat is in the field of pediatric uh, cardiology for more than uh, two decades is head of a cardiology unit hospital and uh, he does lot of social service so um, he needs no introduction dr mahantesh is a renowned cardiologist of uh, karnataka and we are very fortunate to have him as uh, our president i request uh, dr mahantesh uh, charanthimat sir kindly give the welcome note sir good evening everybody thanks to newman for bringing all the eminent speakers to the csi forum and uh, once again warm welcome to all the speakers and audience august audience and is a very wonderful talk regarding the evidence guidelines and practice and is to be delivered by three noted international speakers and our national noted speaker and i am going to introduce them one by one and i am going to introduce first dr gordon gaid he is an academic physician who believes that research and evidence should guide clinical practice this is very very important and we are all aware that in 2021 acc has come out with a consensus statement regarding application of this guidelines in management of various cardiovascular diseases that is 
guidelines directed medical therapy including cardiac rehabilitation because people who are on that gdmt and people who are suboptimal gdmt have a different outcomes and he coined the terms what to call evidence based medicine during his early career as a young researcher in 1991 and brought to the world attention about this evidence based medicine he was inducted into the canadian medical hall of fame in 2015 for his contribution to the medical field dr gaid joins us today uh, to discuss the evidence behind the secondary prevention in reducing cardiac events and mortality and morbidity coming to the dr rajiv gupta is a very pioneer in cardiovascular epidemiology in india the jaipur heart watch study which he initiated in 1990 is one of the longest cardiovascular epidemiological study in the country he is a member of several steering committees and is a lead investigator in population urban and rural epidemiological study what is known by pure and dr gupta also is joining today to deliver his the important topic uh, especially patient outcomes after coronary event and what are the barriers in practicing evidence based cardiology especially in india and coming to the ravinder singachada and he is one of the very noted eminent interventional cardiologist of india and also he is a decorated since commendation of the indian air force and dr chada has served in the armed force in the armed force medical services for the 30 years and he has performed more than 1000 procedures uh, 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 interventional cardiac in the interventional uh, procedures uh, especially he is well versed with very complex uh, angioplasties and dr chada is giving about his uh, perspective on the challenges faced by the most practitioners and his view on, on how we require to overcome and also he is going to talk about on this uh, uh, you know like uh, Uh, the importance of this uh, 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 guidelines based uh, evidence based uh, uh, practice uh, and how we require to apply in our day to day practice and also regarding uh, the his uh, uh, expert opinion on this uh, uh, rehabilitation programs also so with this i uh, uh, hand over the session to the forum and to the speakers please okay. come on the board sir thank you thank you uh, president dr manthi sir now uh, quickly we will move on to uh, keynote address by professor uh, k satish satish sir is uh, a dm cardiology from km mumbai he is professor and head of unit at uh, sri jaydeva institute of cardiovascular science and research it's the largest uh, institute in southeast asia and he is a very avid reader he is a researcher and he is a, um, a very good intervention cardiologist so we would uh, uh, welcome uh, professor satish sir for his keynote address satish sir uh, good evening uh, dr natesh uh, dr charanthimat eminent luminaries on stage so it's a privilege and honor for me to be presenting the keynote address in this august meeting i like to thank csa bangalore chapter dr natesh for giving me this opportunity so so i want to discuss about like how cad is different in indians cardiovascular disease as you know is leading cause of death globally a large number of people die of cardiovascular disease even in 2019 close to 18 million people died representing 32% of all global deaths accounting purely with for cardiovascular disease and what we need to understand is low and middle income countries contribute three quarters of these cvd deaths and proportions of males and females so close to 50% of the deaths among cardiovascular diseases is because of coronary artery disease in males and females are also not very far away the death due to cardiovascular disease accounts to close to 40% in them and how india fares in this scenario so we have many articles published in newspapers and all like where we come across heart disease striking early some anecdotal reports 
and what are the startling facts we have here estimates indicate india accounts for approximately 60% of the world's heart burden despite having less than 20% of the world's population and it tends to occur earlier in indians as compared to the western population and with higher mortality rates and furthermore 50% of all heart attacks in indian men occur in age less than 50 years and staggeringly 25% of them in less than 40 years of age and these are the cvds are the largest causes of death across all uh, articles or publications what we come across as you can see here like majority of the deaths in this million death study was because of cardiovascular disease much more than cancers and diarrhea or infective causes of death and what are the unique features of cardiovascular disease in india so as i told earlier it has a high mortality rate and premature mortality is also very high because we come across uh, cad in indians at a decade earlier than the western population and premature mortality when we mean less than 60 years of age 31% of these cardiovascular deaths occur in age ages less than 60 years of age so in their very productive age this cardiovascular disease affects the indians and comparative study of between caucasians and south asians again earlier age of onset is one striking feature what we see in coronary artery disease in south asians which also includes indians and also the uh, prevalence of double vessel disease or triple vessel disease is much much higher as compared to caucasians and what are the uniqueness of south asian coronary artery disease first thing is premature atherosclerotic disease the arteries are smaller and severe atherosclerosis in the young what we see and more triple vessel disease and diffuse and distal disease and also very often they present with LU dysfunction probably because of late presentation and for intervention also we come across quite often bifurcation lesions and for surgeons endarterectomy very often they have to do and in million death study as you can see here in the middle ages the proportion of cardiovascular disease is very high between 40 to 60 years uh, taking uh, only uh, cardiovascular disease as the outcome and mortality in south asians and caucasians after pci in the uk this was a retrospective analysis of close to 3 lakh patients undergoing pci for 10 years from for 7 years 2004 to 11 and what they found was south asians were younger but had more extensive disease and major risk factors especially diabetes however after correcting all these differences the in hospital and medium term mortality in south asians was no worse than caucasians and what we need to understand here is the high prevalence of diabetes exerts an adverse influence on mortality as we know like india is becoming the diabetic capital of the world this is the cliche we've been hearing for last one decade or two decade and it is true to some extent and the conclusion here ethnicity itself is not an independent predictor of outcome what are the risk factors for cad in the young so genetic risk factors there are multiple genes involved in this and according to inter heart study so apo b apo a1 and other behavioral risk factors like smoking psychosocial and lack of exercise and all these contribute to earlier onset of coronary artery disease in the indians and here in this case control study of risk factors in premature cad in india smoking contributed to 20% of all causes for coronary artery disease much more than diabetes so and also the genetically in mediated high homocysteine levels lipoprotein littleness contribute to some extent what are the emerging risk factors social determinants of health obviously and other like novel risk factors lipoprotein little a and also high triglycerides small dense ldl especially what we see in diabetics with oxidized ldl and low hdl and even if hdl on assessment biochemical assessment may, may be normal but there will be dysfunctional hdl and environmental factors like environmental pollution also is a major contribution for this premature coronary artery disease and what about the socio economic status whether it is more in middle and low income countries so pure study it assessed the cardiovascular disease and mortality based on the economic status of the population and you can see here in this bar diagram the middle and low income have high event rates for major cardiovascular disease as well as the case fatality is much higher in middle income and low income so what is this paradox so we observed in this study, they observed a low risk factor, high mortality paradox in low income countries. This suggests significant gaps in primary prevention and control of risk factors. 
it also indicates inferior disease management and poor secondary prevention in them so what are the implications so focus should be on early identification and proper management of cardiovascular risk factors and better quality treatment of acute events and also we need to advise them regarding long term secondary prevention strategies like lifestyle other instrument medications revascularizations challenges for cvd care in india what like what we are supposed to do or what challenges we face it is high burden of coronary artery disease and associated with premature mortality and high case fatality and with significant regional variation and we have a challenge of health system accessibility for the population in india lack of access cost of care is high out of pocket expenditure because most of them are don't have any insurance and concluding why is cvd premature and malignant in south asians so premature onset of the standard risk factors interactions of the standard risk factors as well as novel risk factors and always also modified by genes and environment and why is it malignant so because of the disease phenotype as i like in the earlier slides i had discussed social determinants of ill health low social economic status pollution and other things and there is significant gap in healthcare system accessibility also is a question questionable component here and quality of primary prevention and risk factor control is not that well developed and acute cid management is like requires uh, a lot of attention now and poor secondary management of this coronary artery disease patients thank you thank you uh, very much uh, professor satish sir Uh, Satish sir has raised uh, very valid uh, questions uh, to be looked forward to be answered or to be discussed in this session, like challenges in uh, CVD care, standard risk and novel risk factors, why it is malignant. Uh, I am very thankful to Professor uh, Satish K sir for uh, giving this uh, enlightening and uh, raising our concerns on the management of CVD in this country. With this background, I think we'll move on to the. the talk proper that is a uh, well awaited talk by the international speaker dr gordon gayat sir uh, dr gordon gayat he started the uh, the grade system it's uh, it's like a scoring system which has been developed uh, as the guiding tool for clinicians today more than 100 institutions have adopted grade as a way to systematically review guidelines so this method is simple and transparent to judge uh, evidence however it is also important to judge the formulated recommendations so let us find out uh, what the practical application of this simple method can be i welcome the pioneer in the uh, evidence based medicine and dr gordon gayat sir over to you sir uh, thanks very much so i presume i can share my screen is that correct for the presentation yes sir you can present okay great All right. So you've heard uh that the great approach is used for rating quality of evidence in systematic reviews and guidelines and uh strength of recommendations in guidelines. So I'm going to give a brief overview of what great does. This will include a little bit about the background, the two steps one rating confidence certainty or quality of evidence those are all synonyms and the strength of recommendation and then some details about each of the confidence and evidence and moving from evidence to recommendations the grade working group which produced this system started to meet in 2000 and the first paper describing the approach appeared in the BMJ in 2004 guidance for clinicians to understand the great approach appeared in a six part series in the british medical journal in 2008 another series of papers have appeared in the journal of clinical epidemiology starting in 2011 and continuing to the present so far a 30 part series this one is directed at the people producing systematic reviews and guideline developers you've already heard mention 
that over 110 organizations worldwide have adopted the GRADE approach. Uh, they include the World Health Organization, uh, the Cochrane Collaboration, uh, American thoracic, major American organizations like the American Thoracic Society and the American College of Physicians and leading international electronic textbooks that people use, including UpToDate and Dynamed. So a lot of uptake. So you will see grade uh, around quite a bit. There are two components that we are rating when we use GRADE. One is the quality of evidence. Synonyms for the quality of evidence include our confidence in the evidence or the certainty of the evidence. And you can think of quality or confidence or certainty of the evidence as a continuum going from no confidence at all to totally confident. GRADE divides this continuum into four categories and classifies evidence as high, moderate, low, or very low. Just to clarify some potential misunderstandings of GRADE, um, it is not about rating single studies. Is it about rating complete bodies of evidence? Typically, uh, for most of our questions, we have multiple studies, and GRADE is about rating the quality of the evidence for those multiple studies. Ideally, these studies will be summarized in a systematic review, which would provide a trustworthy summary of the evidence, the quality of which we can then grade. The grade also produces not only a system for rating quality, confidence, or certainty of evidence, but also strength of recommendations. The grade approach to rating strength of recommendations is very simple, a binary approach, either strong recommendations or weak recommendations. This slide summarizes how GRADE rates the quality of the evidence, certainty of evidence, confidence in evidence. Randomized systematic reviews of randomized trials will start as high confidence or certainty or quality of evidence. Observational studies will start as low certainty or quality or confidence in the evidence. The randomized trials, however, may not end up as high certainty evidence. For instance, the available randomized trials may have high risk of bias, lack of concealment, blinding, or a large loss to follow up. The results may be inconsistent some studies appear to show a convincing effect, others do not, and one cannot explain the heterogeneity. Indirectness. Uh, I practice as a general internist. Um, I'm sure this is not yet true in India, but it may happen at some points, but many of my patients are over the age of 90, and certainly many, many of them over the age of 80. Such patients have not been enrolled frequently in randomized trials, and although the patients appear otherwise eligible, I have my doubts as to whether the uh, evidence from the randomized trials can be applied with confidence to my patients. As a result, the, uh, the evidence from the randomized trials provides only indirect evidence for the very old patients. If there are a small number of trials and wide confidence intervals, we lose confidence because of imprecision and then uh, have to consider as well publication bias. Bottom line, randomized trials charge as high certainty evidence, but any of these five problems can lead to rating down to moderate or low, or even a very occasionally very low. Observational studies start as low and can go to very low if they have these problems, but they uh, can also go up. And that typically happens with large or very large effects. So we have no doubt, for instance, that patients with terminal renal failure live longer with dialysis, that patients in anaphylactic shock get better with uh, epinephrine, that people in diabetic ketoacidosis live longer uh, when they are given uh, insulin, 
and patients with pulmonary edema get better when we give them furosemide. In each case, we have large effects that happen quickly, and so we have high certainty or quality of evidence, even though there are no randomized trials. So on occasion, with very large effects that happen quickly, observational studies can produce high quality evidence. I'll now move from the rating of quality evidence to deciding on the strength of the recommendations. Clearly, the recommendations are informed by the evidence and you will make a strong recommendation when benefits clearly outweigh the downsides of treatment or when the downsides of the treatment clearly outweigh the benefits. How do we decide on our recommendations? Well, uh, there are a number of issues we consider of which uh, there are three major ones. The balance between the desirable The more that the, that, that the desirable consequences outweigh the uh, undesirable consequences, the more likely we are going to have a strong recommendation. The more closely balanced the desirable and undesirable consequences, the more likely we are going to have a weak or conditional recommendation. Quality of the evidence. If the evidence is high or moderate quality, we are more likely to have a strong recommendation. If it is low or very low, which means we are uncertain about the benefits and the uh, uh, harms of treatment, it's pretty tough to make a strong recommendation when you're uncertain of the benefits and the harms because how can you tell with confidence that the benefits outweigh the harms or vice versa? So low quality evidence is much more likely to lead to a weak recommendation. And finally, patient values and preferences. There are always trade-offs between the, the desirable and undesirable uh, consequences of treatment. If, we are if a guideline panel is confident of patients' values and preferences, if the, they believe that the preferences are similar between patients, um, then we might maybe more likely to make a strong recommendation. Uh, if the guideline panel is uncertain about patient values and preferences and or believes that they are very different across patients, more likely a weak recommendation. Those are generally the issues that every guideline panel will consider. They may also consider costs, the acceptability of the interventions, the feasibility of the interventions, and equity considerations. I'm currently working with the WHO in producing guidelines for COVID treatments and for many of our treatments, acceptability, feasibility, and equity issues for this in this sort of situation are highly relevant. What can clinicians interpret when they see strong versus weak recommendations? One is variability in patient preference. If you conducted a shared decision-making exercise um, and you believe that all or almost all fully informed patients would make the same choice, that's what a strong recommendation means. A panel believes that all or almost all fully informed patients would make the same choice. A weak recommendation would mean presented with and understanding the evidence, patients would make di different choices. Hopefully, if the panel's got their recommendation right, the majority would choose the recommended course of action, but a minority would not. Perhaps the most important implication of this strong and weak is the implications for interaction with the patient. A, if a strong recommendation, if the patient, if the panel has got it right, and all or almost all fully informed individuals would make the same choice, one can just say to the patient, here's what I think you should do, and here's why I think you should do it. On the other hand, if the panel has made a weak recommendation, it means they believe that the right choice would differ for different patients according to their values and preferences. And thus, shared decision-making process would be required to ensure that the choice for an individual patient was the right choice. 
decision aids can help with shared decision making. A strong recommendation, it might be a waste of time. A weak recommendation would be an indication for a decision aid. And finally, in terms of quality of care, strong recommendations are, cons are considerations for quality of care. Weak recommendations are not because the right thing to do differs from patient to patient. So in conclusion, clinician policymakers need evidence of summary, evidence summarizing the evidence, and they need to know the quality of that evidence and the strength of the recommendations that arise from that evidence. GRADE provides explicit guidance for these ratings of quality of evidence and how to decide on the recommendation and its strength. The process is not intrinsically a simple one, but GRADE makes it as simple as possible and is transparent and systematic with, we believe, quite deservedly wide adoption. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. It was a wonderful, enlightening talk on the routine quality of evidence and uh, grading. Uh, we learned about the two steps of grade and uh, how to interpret this confidence and uh, determinants of strength of recommendation. What was more important is significance of strong versus weak in considering uh, evidence in the uh, evidence-based medicine. I am very thankful to Dr. Gordon Gard, sir. I'm sure there will be questions at the, after the panel discussion. Uh, again, uh, thank you very much from CSI Bangalore for sparing your valuable time and enlightening us on the use of GRADE. Thank you, sir. My pleasure. Thank you. Now, I move on to the next session. Uh, Dr. Rajiv Gupta, sir, he has been a pioneer in uh, cardiology, uh, especially the CVD related deaths is a leading cause amongst male and female in this country. Uh, most of the events uh, can be mitigated if we focus on the risk management and secondary prevention. Today, we are uh, hoping to learn many things from uh, Dr. Rajiv Gupta, sir, regarding secondary prevention of CVD. The uptake of secondary prevention in India has been slow and what are the remedies and what do we expect? Let's find out the hurdles and uh, over to uh, Dr. Raji Gupta, sir, a very senior cardiologist of this country and a treasure of knowledge. Uh, we hope to be enlightened by our uh, senior teacher, Dr. Raji Gupta, sir. Over to you, sir, Dr. Raji Gupta. Thank you. Thank you very much for your nice words and words of uh, compliments. And I'm thankful to uh, CSI Bangalore for uh, CSI Karnataka for giving me th this opportunity to talk on a very important topic actually, which interests all cardiologists who are managing patients and also physicians who are also managing long-term patients with coronary artery disease. So I will just start with the uh, sharing of my screen. There you go. Oops. Sir, you can tell it slideshow. Yeah, I'll just suggest on the slideshow, please. Yeah, uh, what's Next something? to view, review slideshows. Yeah. Animations, after animation slides, yeah, slideshow. So we'll talk of the evidence practice gap and this is the major area of interest to all of us that uh, how do we uh, uh, fix or we fix this gap, which is very important, not only in our country, but all over the world. I begin with a story, and the story was told by uh, Satish Kaushik uh, Satish, or Satish also in the earlier parts of this uh, session. And this is the story from the Pure study. 
Professor Gayat is from McMaster, and many of us have, uh, I mean, uh, he must, he is a colleague of Salim Yusuf, and we have been working with Salim for the last uh, 20 years now. And this study known as Prospective Urban Rural Epidemiological Study was basically designed in India and then went on to 17 countries in the first phase, and now it's about 25 countries. Now, what normally we expect is that the risk factors in Indians are much more as compared to the uh, uh, other parts of the world. And that was the usual expectation that we have greater prevalence of risk factors. But the peer study showed that the risk factors, the inter-heart risk score was lower or lowest in low-income countries. This includes India, Pakistan, and some countries in South Asia, and a couple of countries in Africa. So the risk was low, but then if you look at the event rates for major cardiovascular disease, that means other acute MI or strokes or uh, acute coronary syndromes, much more higher uh, in the low income countries, including India. Though these are follow-ups of about 150,000 people from India, about 30,000, 10-year follow-up data. And what you see other, other, on the other, on the, this uh, other slide is that contrary to usual belief that mortality was much more in the rural population of India as compared to the urban population. So clearly there is a paradox and this paradox was highlighted earlier, low risk factor, high CVD mortality. Normally you expect that the risk factors are high, there'll be high mortality, but here there's a paradox in India and other low-income countries. And what has been highlighted is low quality primary prevention, acute CVD management. But what we believe is gaps in secondary prevention are also important. And there are lots of gaps and I'll just show you those things. Now, this is just a slide to show the uh, short-term mortality following acute coronary syndromes in India. Uh, you see large registries create was 20,000 people. Kerala ACS was 25,000. And then there are small rates from, from Himachal Assam. Substantial mortality from acute STEMI, almost 10 to 12%, which is almost twice the mortality in grace in Europe, Euro heart again in Europe, and action in the US. So clearly we are not doing well as far as the acute coronary syndrome management is concerned. But what, Today's focus is secondary prevention. And Salim many years ago wrote an editorial in the Lancet saying that if you give all the four evidence-based therapies to these people in the usual care without these drugs, the mortality was high, close to 10%, two-year mortality following acute myocardial infarction. Give aspirin, it goes down by about 25% give a beta blocker again, more 25%, statins, more 25%, and ACE inhibitors, you combine all these four drugs, you can reduce the mortality from 10% to 2.3. And this is old data, current data suggests that you can reduce the mortality, the annual mortality to less than 1% if you use good quality secondary prevention. So we have guidelines, these are the latest uh, guidelines and all of us are aware of most of them. I chose a very non-controversial uh, book chapter from Harrison because Harrison, I think everybody takes as a Bible, in, at least in India. And you have a healthy lifestyle, which is a lifelong commitment in patients for secondary prevention, physical activity, healthy diet, smoking, tobacco cessation, alcohol and cardiac rehab. Again, many of them are class one, some of them are class two, and there is some controversy about the dietary factors. But then four or five, four standard medication in secondary prevention, we all know of single uh, versus dual antiplatelet therapies. Uh, aspirin, of course, is class one. Uh, or any single drug is class one, but Dual antiplatelet therapy now with the emergence of ticagrelor is now we're coming down to one month or dual antiplatelet. And of course, the standard of care is about one year or 12 months of dual antiplatelet followed by a single uh, uh, drug. 
Statins is class one evidence again, beta blockers, class one, at least for the first two or three years. And after that, depending on the risk profile of the patient, ACE inhibitors, uh, class one in people with reduced ejection fraction of less than 50%, I would say, not less than 30%, less than 50%, class one indication. And then uh, in the normal person, normal LV function, you have controversy. So clearly we have four drugs to be uh, taken care of, but what, how are we doing? And we performed a study some years ago. Uh, one of my postgraduate students went around Rajasthan, interviewed 3, 300 physicians, evaluated their prescriptions. So this was a basically a prescription audit. And what we find was is that at tertiary hospital level, tertiary care clinic level, secondary care clinic level, and primary care level. And you see that clearly statins are very less used in primary care. ACE ARBs are not, well, not bad, but still low, beta blockers are low, and aspirin again is only about 67%. So almost a third of patients do not receive aspirin, and more than 80% do not receive statin, at least in primary care. And if you see all the four drugs, even in the tertiary care hospital, only about 50, half of them, uh, they are on all the four drugs. This is within a, within a, within, within a year of uh, acute coronary event. So clearly there are gaps in the prescription by the physicians. But in the pure study, what we found was that the, uh, what are the gaps at the level of community? And uh, what you see here is about three to four years after the acute event, people who had who are known coronary artery disease, how are they taking all these four drugs? And clearly you see in the low income countries and the lower middle income countries, including India and China, the use of these drugs were extremely low, less than one in five on antiplatelets, one in 10 on beta blockers, one in 10 on ARBs, and less than one in 20 on statins. So clearly huge gaps as far as the consumption of these drugs is concerned. Uh, one factor uh, which determines the uh, consumption is availability and affordability. And again, you see in India, uh, availability of these drugs is very low as compared to high income countries, where some of these are available at least to 90% of the people. And if you don't have availability of these drugs, follow up of the pure study cohort has shown that the mortality is almost 20 to 30% greater if you are not on these drugs as compared to if you're on these drugs. So what can be done? And I'll just briefly summarize what are the evidences uh, of a need, what needs to be done. Professor Gayat told, talked about high quality clinical care. And I think this is the most important criteria. And that's what is the uh, uh, missing link in low income countries, including India. We do not have focus on high quality clinical care, especially in primary and secondary cares. Uh, our definition is patient safety, effectiveness, patient centeredness and strong health systems. And the IOM Institute of Medicine definition is it has to be safe, effective, patient centered, efficient, timely and equitable. And I think it's very important for all of us to remember that we need high quality clinical care both in primary prevention and secondary prevention and acute coronary syndrome care to reduce mortality. How can we promote secondary prevention? Because we are just focusing on secondary prevention. There are long list of uh, interventions could be physician specific. We need to educate our physicians. We need to have a regular audit and feedback programs, use of reminders, computers, task substitution, collaborations, campaigns, quality interventions. But we also need to have patient support, patient specific interventions. And I think which are the missing link, at least in many of, in many of our patients in our country, we need better, better social support, family healthcare workers, appropriate education. We need monitoring of compliance. We need to simplify medication regimes, combinations, polypills, fixed drug combinations. We need to have appropriate drug selections, electronic monitors, and behavioral strategies. 
but ultimately what what works best is a combination of all these so i think combined interventions is the way forward just a brief on the polypill based technologies but this is basically for stable patients with coronary artery disease in ischemic heart disease we have a number of trials showing combinations of statins antiplatelets beta blockers arbs they at least the empire trial showed that they promote adherence uh, at the end of 2 years in low income countries including india and britain both uh, in the high income and low income countries so it's important but as a physicians and cardiologists we always talk we always uh, well debate titration and right but we need titrable formulations fortunately in india they are widely available but not in most parts of the world there could be a polypills for heart failure and now we know that there are four major pillars of heart failure management beta blockers arnis or the arni arb combinations mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists and agilt2 receptor inhibitors but what i think uh, as a as a clinician i'll think that there's a difficult iteration there are lots of confounders and the role of diuretics is still is still not clear again we could have polypill for diabetes we could have polypill for hypertension but that's not the topic for today technology is important and i think uh, there's the way of future that technology and patient empowerment are important and eric topol has written a very nice book on this uh, patient empowered technologies using cell phone there are lots of functions which a cell phone can do a cell phone can do but many of them are important for secondary prevention especially being a tele doctor it can run a vital signs it can be cost effective it can be like a uber you can immediately cause call an ambulance it can keep a store of your records and it could be a personal medic medical cloud so lots of things are possible using technology for secondary prevention and finally what is the role of cardiologists and physicians treating patients they could improve patient engagement adherence for secondary prevention what they need to do we need to have clear advice regarding benefits and possible adverse effects of medications it should be told to every patient to gain patient confidence we have to provide clear guidelines on duration and timing of dosing all of us have seen patients after 3 months or 6 months or 1 year once the cholesterol levels are stabilized once the blood pressure is controlled they tend to stop their medication so they have to be told that this is a lifelong commitment and basically prevention is a lifelong affair especially in secondary prevention we need to take care of patient habits and preferences we need to reduce dosage demands or deprescribe uh, de to the lowest feasible levels we need to discuss the reasons for non adherence with patients we need to implement repetitive monitoring and feedback physician assistants are very useful nursing nurses are very useful but for persistent non adherence we need to provide combination therapies and multi session consults so these are very important and for, i think i believe that if cardiologists do all these things it will be a very useful way of uh, promoting adherence and facilitating secondary prevention thank you very much for your attention thank you thank you sir it was a very enlightening uh, dr rajiv gupta sir as uh, sir is uh, has used all his expertise uh, long stay in the field of cardiology he has briefed us regarding pure study the risk factors major cvd events the secondary prevention guidelines uh, a new uh, look at secondary prevention guidelines the polypill based technologies more important is the technology in uh, secondary prevention which is a new uh, i felt it is a very new concept and uh, what is the role of cardiologist it's a new insight uh, thank you very much uh, dr rajiv gupta sir thank for uh, giving a wonderful presentation on behalf of csf bangalore we are immensely thankful to you thank you sir uh we move on to the third topic very important uh, topic by dr davinder uh, chadda sir chadda sir in uh, karnataka is known for uh, uh, 
rescuing us from difficult uh, procedures like uh, ct uh, i was then uh, galvanic lesions uh, branch lesions uh, left mains so he has been a pioneer in uh, intervention cardiology and uh, sir is uh, dealing today with evidence which helps from guidelines and guidelines help the practice in life we wish for some smooth sailing however that rarely comes so given the fact that cardiac rehabilitation is a range of from human error to institutional limitation let us find out how technology is helping us to dodge these roadblocks and change the landscape of practice let's learn uh, the evidence based uh, guidelines and practice from dr ravinder davinder chada sir chada sir a warm welcome sir and thank you natesh it's, it's an honor i thank uh, uh, csi karnataka for giving me this opportunity and uh, it, it's an honor to share the platform with two stalwarts and uh, they have in their talks uh, you know enlightened us about the uh, a real world evidence which is available and uh, it is my duty now to present um, how well are we applying this evidence and um, how, what are the gaps in uh, application of these recommendations or evidence so uh, i am an um, interventionist and uh, my job will be incomplete if i don't share a case so i'll share two uh, patients with you uh, the first one is a 57 year old male diabetic he had anterior wall mi um, six months ago and um, he had ecg changes to suggest the same echo showed moderate lv dysfunction he had regional wall motion abnormalities and since um, uh, he had an event earlier he also had undergone a mpi scan which showed a mixed fixed as well as reperfusion uh, defect in the anterior and inferior wall we took him up for angiogram and this is what we noticed he had double vessel disease and he had a chronic total occlusion of a lady now if you see the chronic total occlusion of a lady there are two big branches coming out and standard recommendation is that even if a single branch comes out you should not attempt this patient was offered cabg and he was totally unwilling for cabg so we took him up for angioplasty a difficult angioplasty because two branches coming out of the stump which is not delineated but um, we could manage to cross and um, we got fairly good results we were happy it took about 2 to 1 half hours to open this vessel uh, but uh, good results at the end uh, six weeks later he came back again with symptoms and this is what you get the stent is totally blocked off we had worked so hard and within six weeks the uh, result is brought to not and we had to open the stent again there was a lot of thrombus in the vessel and we were quite surprised so we we were shocked rather and uh, we went ahead and uh, asked a few question why did the stent fail so when we when we have stent failures we know that there are certain patient vessel related procedural factors and uh, some factors which are related to the discharge document of the patient so what are the factors which are present in this this patient happened to be a diabetic yes he had a chronic occlusion he had a very long lesion he had a type c lesion but the most important of all these emerged there was a missing drug in the discharge document ticagrelor was missed and he was discharged on a single antiplatelet drug so that's what led to um, subacute stent thrombosis and the patient was back early this was the final angio run after we opened there is little bit of residual thrombus in the vessel but we let it pass by second case is a 67 year old female again a diabetic who had undergone an angioplasty in 2018 came back with class 3 angina with normal lv function again reperfusion defect in the inferior wall so this was the index angioplasty in 2018 um, rca showing a discrete lesion which was tented with a three point very good results and in fact you can see that the uh, disease segment was quite well uh, stented she came back within one year or one and a half years of the index angioplasty at this stage the left system appeared normal but the right uh, injection showed a focal instant restenosis this was within the stent and we were quite surprised as to why this has happened so early when the stent was implanted well and expanded well we again asked same questions this was a female so females generally have more chances of stent failure she was also diabetic and uh, she had an isr she had under expanded probably maybe an under expanded stent which was doubtful but it was the issue of medical 
adherence, medication adherence. So we discovered that she was a diabetic, but for the last six to eight months, she had stopped taking anti-diabetic uh, medication. And we know what it does to uh, you when you have uh, diabetes and you don't take your medication. So all we did was a drug eluting balloon. We just opened this segment and we let it be. So uh, what are the preventable causes of poor results in practice? If you're an interventionist and you're doing something and you want good results, the first is the non-adherence to instructions. You know, most of the time the patient is absolutely not aware as to what drug is for what, and patients continue to take uh, statins regularly, but they skip on their antiplatelets. There will be absolutely no attention paid to the other other um, uh, medication. There is also a lot of misinformation which is around. There is a Doctor Google available in each house, and if you come from an illiterate background, the Dr. Google comes into play much more strongly and you'll be misinformed and you'll be doing a lot of things which you're not supposed to be doing. So these are real world problems that you face in uh, practice and you have to counter them. There are certain communication gaps, you know, um, the, uh, the instructions given to the patient at times are not very clear. I'll dwell upon this a little later. So these communication gaps lead to uh, break in the ongoing therapy. These lead to non-compliance with the medication. And this is probably because of non-effective uh, counseling at the hospital. You know, you each one of us is supposed to counsel the patient and we have counselors available, but are they doing their duty well? It, it's 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 a question to be asked and we need to answer this question. Now, let's talk about patient counseling. If you see at the time of admission, each one of us is pretty focused because the patient is sick. We explain to the relatives as to what the problem is. We explain in detail what the uh, remedial measures are going to be apart from drug. And if it's an interventional procedure, we tend to spend even more time because this has got a lot of complications uh, which come along with the intervention. So the uh, basic bottom line, what I'm trying to tell you is that patient counseling at the time of admission is pretty long and the contact of the physician as patient is very long. What happens at discharge? The emphasis at this stage is, you know, the counselor kind of tells the patient that you have to be compliant, but this is a passing remark without even mentioning what is the uh, duration of therapy, which is going to be because most of the patients go out thinking that the drug therapy has been only for a fixed duration and now that I've got a stent in place, uh, everything is solved. A lot of them also don't know what exactly is going to be the pace of their daily activities, how quickly if you have an acute MI, how quickly you can return to your activities of daily living. Leave, leave apart uh, counseling about the diet, exercise, mental health. Now, I, I, I lay a lot of importance to all this because in all the tertiary care centers in India, there are cardiac rehab centers, there are nutritionists, there are physiotherapists available. But I, I can bet if more than 5% of our cardiac patients go through them. No, they don't go through them because uh, it, it's not in the culture of the cardiologist to refer their patients to these departments to uh, let them learn the other important aspects of care, which is very, very important because the disease is going to be lifelong. Most importantly, the at discharge, the contact with the treating doctor is pretty short. The remark is that I have done the job well, I have put a stent, the vessel is flowing, need not worry, everything is going to be fine without putting any emphasis on the other important factors. So there is a lack of, uh, there is certainly a communication gap and um, even worse is that the patient cannot get back to the treating doctor because the treating doctor is busy, he's not available. So even if small problems come up, he consults some physician close by and then God only save if the prescription gets modified in the process. So there are, in addition, I've also noticed a lot of lacking in the discharge documents. This probably stemmed from the fact that the treating doctor is not always the one who signs the document or scrutinizes the document. It's a teamwork. So you have residents, you have uh, other associates who are working. And once the verdict is there that the patient has to be discharged, a person who ends up signing the document has been very little in contact with the patient. So there can be a lot of omissions and commissions in the discharge document. Listing of disabilities can go wrong and we all have experienced this and I'm reasonably sure all those who have logged into this webinar will identify with the points which I've mentioned 
in this slide. You know, um, drugs prescriptions can accordingly go wrong because there are patients who being diabetic are labeled as non-diabetic and non-diabetics get labeled as diabetic. The dosage inappropriate uh, accordingly can be inappropriate for a given disability. And uh, this becomes very, very glaring if you have patients with multiple disabilities, because very rarely you will take into consideration the drug interactions because we uh, have a prescription with multiple drugs and some of them could be interacting with the others, so which is not uh, kind of looked into. Importantly, these the importance of specific drugs. And if you're intervening, you need to talk a little bit about and dual antiplatelets. You have patients from all the uh, strata coming to you. I mean, lower to higher socioeconomic strata. And it's it, it, it was uh, uh, brought to the notice from the peer study that the lower socioeconomic strata is not doing well. But you have a lot of people coming from the upper strata who also have not understood their disease well. And some of them think that intervention is the point treatment being offered. They have not been educated about the long-term therapy which they would need. And specifically, when we do complex work, we would we lay a lot of emphasis on antiplatelets. The patient uh, often takes antiplatelets and skips the other important uh, medication. Uh, duration of therapy at times is not specified to the patient. So we often come across patients who have stopped their drugs. And that's what Dr. Raji was saying when he presented his study, uh, where he noticed that the important drugs, the class one indication drugs have not been uh, continued in these uh, patients. Uh, let's not talk about physical activity and diet. They don't figure at all in the itinerary of the cardiologist when they are talking to the patients. Well, there is a need felt for post-discharge counseling. And this essentially, this need comes from the fact that we need to improve the outcomes. How, how can we improve upon this? Yes, by having a robust cardiac rehabilitation program. You now, cardiac rehabilitation does exist in the country and it is a program which is uh, uh, established multidisciplinary mode of care to mitigate the burden of cardiovascular disease. So you have multiple things coming together. Basic idea is to modify your risk factors, to promote psychosocial health, have cardioprotective therapies in place, and it's a continuum. It's a continuum in terms of you apply these therapies and you keep assessing them over time. You keep auditing and keep seeing whether the patient is doing well or not and accordingly make changes so that the, the continuum risk which is present in this patient is dealt with. Well, it's got class one recommendation, but if you pick and choose, majority of the cardiologists will not be aware that cardiac rehab is a class one uh, indication. So, I, I mean, it is certainly recommended for almost all the diseases across, and it is an essential uh, component of the um, cardiac care. So uh, these are on the slide are listed the important components. I, I think we are practicing a few, but we are not uh, laying emphasis on the other, like tobacco cessation is one. I think I, I'm sure that almost all the cardiologists tell their patients to do that because tobacco is, uh, smoking is one of the major risk factors of uh, premature CAD, which we get to see in the Indian uh, subcontinent. But nobody talks about uh, physical activity or psychosocial counseling. These are absolutely not seen at all. Uh, leave apart the other components which are mentioned on the slide. So um, the, um, the rehab, the cardiac rehab is proven therapy. It has shown, the, uh, shown to reduce the hospital admission rate by a considerable extent and has considerably improved the cardiovascular mortality. But despite all this, the participation rates is abysmal. It's very, very low. And there are multiple advantages of this. And if you look at Indian, uh, Indian uh, India as a country as to how the cardiac rehab is in our country, you have a very low um, rates of cardiac rehab here. As you can see on the slide, this is from a study which was recently published. There is um, a need to have many more centers. The, uh, there is only one cardiac rehab spot available for every 360 patients. So you can imagine um, that nobody has paid attention to this. And it also stems from the fact that there is very poor referral for cardiac rehab because the sensitization of the treating doctors is absolutely low. So they don't refer the patients for cardiac rehab. So the barriers or challenges in India are that it, it is absolutely not being, even if present, it is not being utilized to the full capacity. Uh, 
there are some cardiac rehab programs in south of india but if you go to northeast and western uh, zones the cardiac rehab is kind of missing and east is eastern part of the country is absolutely lacking this now there are uh, india is not a rich country so there are uh, i mean um, factors related to lack of resources capacity and uh, funding and most importantly um, there is poor adherence to cardiac rehab program because if the doctor does not believe in it be rest assured the patient will not uh, be compliant with the rehab program at all well so the we we have poor referrals we have limited availability of program and this is further compounded by unaffordability of the patient so these are three major factors which lead to um, the um, which cause the major barriers or challenges in acceptance of this cardiac rehab program uh, in india so um the uh, the basic um, uh, ways of improving this i will uh, dwell upon this that but we must understand that poor adherence and uptake of this leads to suboptimal uh, benefit so we must do all within our uh, might to uh, make this a uh, success and to get the patients cardiology patients to get into cardiac rehab so what are the ways of improving the ways of improving are that we should try and incorporate the cardiac rehab in the discharge plan so when the patient is going on the going on uh, discharge from the hospital the cardiac rehab should be made mandatory that all these patients have to go through it and it is during the um, days when the patient is there with you you must sensitize that this is a uh, this is the disorder which is going to stay uh, till the time you live and there are certain lifestyle changes which you have to bring about and these are these lifestyle changes will only see that you stay healthy if one makes such comments and if and as you know that when the patient is down and sick it is at that point of time he is most receptive so it is that point of time that we need to tell now india is a very diverse country and people come from different walks of life and different uh, you know regions have got different uh, dietary habits and different uh, languages which people speak so we need to tailor make the rehab program and execute it in a way that there are no communication channels there are no communication gaps which are present and in covid times we need to have a home based cardiac rehab program because we know that um, the uh, it will be very difficult for a patient who feels that he is absolutely healthy to get him back to a hospital to take part in a cardiac rehab program so we need to use the technology i think my previous speakers have highlighted on this point need to have a digital cardiac rehab we uh, india as a country has the cheapest internet uh, um, facilities available and almost every house has got an internet and connectivity is absolutely not an issue we should utilize this to our advantage we should use it so that we can connect with our patients give them advice on the disease tell them the importance of the drugs also sensitize them about the risk factors and how to circumvent these risk factors mere availability of a mobile phone with an internet can circumvent a lot of issues you need not uh, wait for a big rehab center to be opened in your hospital you can get started on on a digital platform and execute this well uh, changing lifestyle is absolutely not easy and um, you have to ask the smokers or those who have been pretty liberal with alcohol they would certainly not listen to you once their chest pain has disappeared so it requires it requires a lot of effort you have to speak to them regularly and it's possible only by what you're using uh, technology to conclude i would say that india has certainly a very high burden of cardiovascular disease and we need cost effective measures for controlling cvd merely putting stents is not going to uh remedy this problem you need to have control over the risk factors and which is only possible if you have a good and a robust cardiac rehab program because you have to keep speaking to your patients you have to keep telling them the importance of risk factor management and you need to put together a multidisciplinary uh, team in a which in a cost effective method Uh, provides the secondary prevention which is very very important we know that without secondary prevention the disease is going to come back and uh, it's going to uh, 
uh, affect the longevity of the person. So proper implementation of cardiac rehab program in our country will certainly reduce the morbidity and mortality. We've seen some very um, scary slides about the disease burden and the mortality. Let's put an effort and strengthen the rehab program so that after the point treatment, we see that this patient, uh, our patients move towards road to health. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Davinder Chedda, sir. It was a wonderful talk uh, as expected. Sir, uh, being a senior intervention cardiologist, he dealt with first case of CTO, then a PDCA to RCA, ISR, and patient counseling at admission and discharge. Probably we you know, tend to forget uh, uh, in the due course of our daily busy schedule and lacunine discharge uh, documents. Robust cardiac rehabilitation program is a real insight today. Uh, the components we have uh, not really, maybe patient and uh, treating doctor also need to be careful with this. A need of cardiac rehab centers. Uh, I saw a whopping figure of 33 lakhs uh, is the need. Uh, it means that we are lagging a, a lot behind what is required. And digital cardiac rehab is some a new insight. So I am very thankful to Dr. Davinder Chetta, sir, you have opened our eyes. It was a wonderful talk. And at this point, I think Newman Health is uh, doing a wonderful job. They have started uh, the robust cardiac rehabilitation programs. And uh, we are probably fortunate to participate with Newman Health in uh, bringing this scientific program. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Davinder Chetta, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Natesh. Thank you. It was... Yeah, we uh, move on to the next program uh, uh, schedule that is a panel discussion and a question answer session. I request uh, Dr. Albin Singamani, sir, a senior uh, person who is uh, very much involved in evidence based medicine. He's involved in many trials also to take over. And uh, um, I hand over this uh, sessions to Dr. Albin Singamani, sir. Thank you. Uh... Dr. Uh, Natesh and uh, esteemed panel, I hope you are audible, I am audible to all of you. So I just thought it would be right to have a few questions asked to the panelists to just set the stage of what was just discussed at this point in time. Uh, uh, the first question I would like to pass it on to Professor Gordon Guyat. First of all, thank you, Dr. Gordon Guide, for being on this session. Uh, Dr. Professor Gordon Guide, how would you uh, recommend, uh, or from your experience of uh, you know introducing grade into guidelines, how would you in, in recommend uh, practicing cardiologists to improve their quality of healthcare that they are able to deliver? Well, uh, you asked me about my experience, but of course I'm an evidence-based guy. So I'm going to tell you about uh, the evidence in terms of behavior change, which uh, I think is behind your question. Um, uh, I'm not an expert in this area. So the first uh, uh, caveat is that uh, I haven't looked at the literature as thoroughly as many others have. However, uh, there have been several hundred randomized trials of behavior changing um, uh, strategies, uh, which have included various aspects of presenting guidelines to people, um, uh, educational influentials, um, audit and feedback, um, getting together people in small groups to discuss and so on, many, many, many different things. As it turns out, it's a disappointing literature um, the effects uh, for individual interventions are uniformly small. Um, and in addition, um, they're variable. And the further disappointment is that if you look at the trials where sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't work, it is not particularly evident when the effects are evident and when they are not. The bottom line is, um, uh, as in many areas, there is still a lot of uncertainty about how to improve uh, clinicians' behavior. Now, that's talking about it as uh, uh, interventions. So um, uh, to, to, I can still offer personal advice, which is to find guidelines you believe 
and that are simple and straightforward, not only that are trustworthy, uh, but that are sufficiently simple and straightforward um, that you can access very easily um, and refer to uh, those guidelines regularly. Um, hopefully they will be structured so that they tell you about updates um, uh, for your practice. Um, there are also services available if you want to know about the latest evidence. Uh, BMJ provides there are many services. BMJ provides one, um, and uh, subscribing to these services would be another way to uh, get the most recent information, the newest information that might influence your practice. Thank you, Dr. Gordon Guide. Uh, my next question would be to Dr. Rajiv uh, Gupta. So you have you know, studied a lot of the risk factors around cardio cardiovascular disease. And you also do talk about a low burden, uh, low risk uh, uh, environment with a high disease burden. And uh, now in this context, what would your recommendation to the cardiologist be in his, what is the role that the cardiologist will have to be playing when there is a patient with comorbid illness? Should he be focusing on the intervention or should be focusing on the control of comorbid illness or is it a combination of the two? If that's true, where do you see he has to draw a balance? Dr. Rajiv Gupta? Uh, maybe Dr. Rajiv Gupta has some difficulty. Maybe this question can be opened up to other panelists on the on from the CSI side, uh, Dr. Srikant or anyone, what do you feel would be the role the cardiologist will have to play, an intervention cardiologist will have to play when there is a patient that is presenting with comorbid illness? Is it to be focused only on the intervention or do you feel that there has to be a focus on both or is there a balance that can be achieved? Hi, good evening. I am Dr. Mahantesh. Uh, it's very important, as uh, Dr. Chadda has mentioned, most of the times, you know, like we are very good till we do the procedures. So after that, we forget. Even before the assessment also, we are very least bothered about the risk factors management. Is the management of lifestyle or management of the diabetes, management of the hypertension. I think uh, we need to balance all those factors as all the speakers uh, elaborated very you know widely on those factors that uh, is a holistic approach is not only a treating or not only putting a stent i feel we need to include the whole panel in the management of patient as a whole so it could be a diabetologist or it could be you know like physiotherapist or it could be uh, the uh, the physician or it could be the vascular surgeon, or it could be uh, the dietitian. All those as a whole, we should approach towards the patient, not only should target on the disease. As a patient, we should treat as a whole. I feel uh, I still we lack in most of the centers, even though I, I, I almost work in most of the, uh, the uh, hospitals in Bangalore, including Jairiwa, still we still we lack that concept of this approach, including the cardiac rehabilitation. Thank I you, think sir. I think that, uh, you know, like is time for all, including in our own, my clinical practice also experience. Sometimes what happened, very simple things like, you know, you treatment advice, you begin, and that begins with the last sentence or last paragraph of the page ending. Then the medicine will begin from the rest from the next page. And we have seen Tigagrelar, most of the times we use it as a first medicine and we miss it. And even it goes to the pharmacist and he only explains or tells about only given that medicines. And you will forget the first medicine which is printed on the last sentence of the, uh, the previous page. So these are all things, very small things, but makes a lot of difference. As uh, Chadasar mentioned of the stent thrombosis, where the missing medication, I think is very important. Thank you, Dr. Mahantesh, on that valuable comments. Uh, my next question will be to Dr. Chadda. Since, sir, you, you have been doing a lot of procedures in your life and you've seen all types of patients. So I just wanted to ask this question because I was also 
told that you know you are a rescuer when you see a complex patient uh, as a cardiologist as an interventional cardiologist do you always look forward to seeing patients coming into the clinic with less severe disease and if so why do you think that is important Thank you. Thank you, Alvin. I, I take on from the previous question and build upon this question. Now, your first question was patients coming with multiple comorbidities. You know, we see um, patients in the fifth and sixth, sixth decade, and about forty to fifty percent of patients come with diabetes. And as you know, diabetes is a systemic disease. It affects your kidneys, affects your eyes, brain. There are multiple organs, and the blood vessels are affected. So, when you have a patient. Coming with a cardiac problem, he also happens to be a diabetic or a hypertensive. You need to approach him holistically. You need to look at the kidney functions, most importantly. You need to look at the LV function. You cannot go and the agent which we use for intervention, the contrast agent which we use is nephrotoxic. So I, you cannot just go in and start putting stents. And at the end of the procedure, you have nice flowing vessels, but these flowing vessels are supplying blood to infarcted uh, myocardium, which is not going to improve the LV function. But the uh, but what you end up doing is that you further cause decline in his renal functions, and there is rising creatinine, which the patient will come back and may probably end up in some of the cases with end-stage renal disease or might develop renal dysfunction. So, and at the same time, we must also, you know, kind of, if you are intervening, we must keep an eye on the blood sugars and other important uh, parameters because elevated blood sugars are going to be the most important factor in uh, restenosis of the stent. And I showed you case example where the anti diabetic medication was missed and the patient stopped taking these uh, drugs. And that is what led to early stent failure. Yes, when I, when I come into the second question, when I intervene in any patient, I look at long-term results. I'm absolutely not happy looking at, at as to what I have achieved on the table. But what is important is what, what this patient is going to end up at the end of one, two, three, or four or five years, which is very, very important. And I always, in all my talks, I emphasize, and that's why I'm a very avid imager. I use a lot of imaging tools. We use drug eluting stent, but these stents are going to work only if you oppose them well against the vessel wall, because the drug has to get eluted onto the uh, surface of the vessel, and it, it shouldn't get just washed into the blood and get excreted out of the kidney. They're then as good as uh, bare metal stents. So you do your job well, you must plan it well. And at the same time, when you're discharging, you must educate the patient well as to what has been done and what are the implications and what, what is expected out of the patient. You know, this is where we lack. We, we need to make patient come and sit in the driver's seat. We need to educate him so that it is at the end of the day, it's his health or her health. And he has to be in the driver's seat. He has to kind of, you know, because most of our patients and they have no understanding of the disease and uh, the risk factors because risk, we are not treating the risk factors. We are suppressing them with medication. And at the end of the day, lifestyle changes, you know, are very, very important. If, done, if one does not uh, stop smoking, one does not exercise. These are things which are not, you know, in the drug prescription. But these are things which have to be implemented. These are things which have to be kind of, you know, uh, talk to the patient and the family members and you have to make them understand. So they play a very, very important role. Thank you, Dr. Chadha. I have the last question to Dr. Garden Gayad and I think it should be really a minute for us to listen to him once more. Uh, Dr. Gayad, uh, we have the uh, Cardiological Society of India from the Bangalore chapter, chapter here. And, you know, we are a large society in this country. Uh, but uh, if I'm to say this correctly, please correct me from, from the CSI side, we yet do not have a treating guidelines. We have consensus documents, but we do not have treating guidelines. In your opinion, sir, uh, do you think it is important for a society or for a body to write guidelines, treatment guidelines in this? How, uh, if, if you say so, how, do you, how important do you think it is? Well, um... This depends, first of all, in where your cardiologists go for their information. Um, do they go to up-to-date or do they go to an American guideline or do they go to an Indian guideline? 
out. Uh, let's assume if, uh, if nobody pays too much attention to your Indian guidelines, then maybe not important. If people in fact go to your Indian guidelines, surely you would want evidence-based guidelines that follow, and there's now well-established standards for trustworthy guidelines. Um, if indeed that is what your practitioners are following, surely you would want trustworthy guidelines. Um, you have an advantage in that um, uh, there are many other groups doing car cardiovascular guidelines, which means that uh, you have the opportunity very often to have the information already summarized and that you can use an adaptation approach finding a trustworthy guideline that is already available and adapting it to your circumstances. I would guess that there would be quite a bit of adaptation necessary given resource constraints, the patient population differs and so on. Uh, but the evidence uh, in cardiology, there are, you have great systematic reviews. Every time something new happens, uh, somebody very quickly comes up with a systematic review summarizing the new evidence. So you have, uh, it, sh it should be manageable to do trustworthy evidence-based guidelines. And if your clinicians in, in uh, India are looking to your guidelines, surely it'd be a great idea to have trustworthy guidelines for them to use. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Gordon Diet. And I think we should be able to conclude our panel discussion. Uh, I hand it over to Dr. Natesh uh, to move it to the next session. Well, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, I think uh, a majority of uh, the questions have been answered. Uh, still in the question answer uh, box, uh, the, what are the available digital CR? There's a question from uh, Dr. Lena. How cost effective are they? Is it good for implementing in rural areas? Uh, does anybody like to touch upon this question, please? Uh, maybe Pallav, you want to answer that question? Well, I think uh, regarding availability of CR, uh, Dr. Davinder Singh Chadha has uh, clearly mentioned that the demand and supply is uh, very poor. There is a lot of demand for CR, uh, cardiac rehabilitation, and the centers available are very less. Maybe metro cities in India do have some facilities, rural areas, and uh, as uh, Dr. Chadha sir said, the eastern part of uh, India, probably there is a lot of requirement and more important is this mindset, uh, which has been, uh, I think, has been changed by all the panelists that uh, the rehabilitation is a very important part of uh, our uh, cardiac program. With this, I think uh, we'll move on, move on to uh, uh, the thanking session. It's my proud privilege, unless there are any uh, no more questions. So we we'll don't move on to any more questions. Yeah, yeah thank you. So we move on to the word of thanks. It's my proud privilege uh, as uh, treasurer of CSI Bangalore to thank uh, our, uh, our president, Dr. Mantesh Charantimat, sir, in spite of his very busy schedule, has been a uh, pillar of strength to CSI Bangalore and all our academic programs, and particularly me, has been my uh, senior and teacher. Thank you very much, Dr. Mantesh, sir. Thank you. And. Uh, the center of uh, today's uh, scientific session, Dr. Uh, Gordon Gayat, sir, has been a pioneer in evidence-based medicine, and uh, he has uh, briefed us regarding use of grade in uh, evidence-based medicine. We are really enlightened, sir. Thank you very much for infusing this, uh, uh, what we, we would call it as a current uh, a topic, a very difficult to understand, making it simple. Thank you, Dr. Gordon Gayat, sir. Thank you. I also thank uh, Professor Satish K as uh, uh, head of uh, unit of cardiology at Jaydev Institute of Cardiology. He just briefed about the uh, issues in this country, uh, the epidemiology part of it, and uh, what uh, we are expecting out of this session. Thank you very much, Dr. Satish, sir. I also like to thank Dr. Rajiv Gupta, sir, a senior cardiologist of India, 
uh, our uh, senior teacher uh, uh, having enlightened us on cardiovascular epidemiology and guidelines. Thank you, uh, Dr. Rajiv Gupta, sir. I thank Dr. Davinder uh, Chedda, sir, is uh, our uh, rescue, sir, a rescue man in uh, Karnataka, Bar Bangalore. And uh, actually, we are getting enlightened on uh, OCT, IVAS, and all the difficult things. Yes, yeah, sir, non-coronary intervention. Non-coronary intervention. Non Today, definitely, he is, he, you know, he opened our eyes regarding uh, cardiac rehabilitation. We were probably, you know, sleeping over it. Thank you very much for uh, awakening us on this very important topic, sir, Dr. Dhanandar Chedda. I thank uh, Dr. Albin Singamani, sir, having uh, dealt uh, this uh, session of uh, uh, panel discussion and question answer session. Thank you very much. I also thank all the national, state, and district members of cardiology of CSI. Uh, I thank all the past presidents, office bearers, and EB members of CSI Bangalore. I can see a lot of uh, EB members, Dr. Shikan, Dr. Divya Prakash, and others. I thank all the postgraduates of various medical colleges who have participated. I thank our office managers of CSI Bangalore, Shilpa Shri and uh, Lakshman. And uh, more importantly, I